Now, um, today, today I'd like to talk to you about, about faith. We sang a good hymn there, didn't we, about faith just there now. Many people seem to struggle with uh, this important subject of faith, wondering what it is and how they can get it. And you know, I fully understand them because uh, when I was a lad about 70 years ago, I struggled greatly with the subject of faith. Quite often a preacher would come to our church and uh, he would speak about faith. And uh, he would invariably speak from Hebrews chapter 11, the great uh, faith chapter of the Bible. So maybe we could start this morning and read the first three verses of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was, made, was not made out of what was visible. Now, I don't know if I was particularly dull but having listened many times to these verses, I still didn't understand what faith was, what it meant to have faith, or how I could get this faith that so many people seem to talk about. Some would give uh, illustrations. Uh, for example, you sit down on a chair with confidence because you have faith that the chair is going to hold you up. Well, I had seen a lot of chairs collapsing. <laughs> you, get, you get on a bus and you trust the driver to get you safely to your destination. But I've heard of two bus crashes this week. But what I had failed to understand, of course, was the fact that God will never collapse or crash. I could safely depend on him trust in him, have faith in him. However, I still find the concept of faith very, very difficult to understand in spite of all these uh, explanations faithfully delivered from the pulpit. I remember one uh, much loved uh, Scottish preacher who used to come to our church sometimes in Ireland and um, he quoted a little lady from the Highlands uh, who said that um, Faith is better felt than telt. In later years, as I tried to explain faith to other people, I sometimes felt like saying the same thing. Then, of course, there is the important question. Um, does, do I come to faith or does faith come to me? Where exactly is the starting point? Well, our chapter goes on to speak about examples of men and women of faith, often referred to as heroes of faith, about whom we read in the Bible. We won't read this long list this morning, but uh, let's just break in at verse 32, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. Sorry. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, who we talked about this morning, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, 
living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now that is certainly a very dramatic passage. If it was being read on television, it would almost certainly come with a warning. The following text contains some remarks which may shock the general public. And it is a really shocking uh, passage. We read about those whose faith enabled them to conquer kingdoms, to shut the mouths of lions. Uh, doesn't say they killed the lions, but <laughs> that as well. Others were sawn in two. Some were killed by the sword and so on. And, you know, as we read all that, we could uh, understandably think that um, our relatively comfortable lives are very far removed from what these people lived. Some might even say, if that's what faith is, well, I don't think I'm ready for it yet. It is a bit scary, isn't it? Now, three questions might be on our minds this morning concerning faith. First of all, what is faith? Then, um, how can I get it? And uh, then how can I subsequently talk about it to others? Now, each of us this morning can no, no doubt feel concerned by at least one of these questions. We know that central to the concept of Christianity is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what we need to believe in order to be a Christian. Uh, 1 John 4.15 reminds us, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You know, it has unfortunately become uh, necessary in our society today uh, to add words like true, born again, or committed to the word Christian in order to clarify what we actually mean by a Christian when we use the word in the biblical context. A true Christian is someone who has a living faith, a meaningful faith, not just a, a religion, and certainly not a kind of nationality. If you feel today that you're not yet a Christian in the biblical sense of the word, well, I trust that you will be able to uh, take that step of faith that is so necessary in order to become a, a true Christian, a committed Christian. For those of us who are already committed Christians, we need to constantly remind ourselves of some of the difficulties experienced by those who do not yet have faith in God or in the work of Jesus on the cross. We all need to understand that faith in God is indeed a reasonable faith. It's not some kind of blind faith or some kind of leap in the dark. For the person who is uh, seeking to have this uh, faith or trust, what uh, evidence can we give to them that might help them in their research? Uh, for many people, I suppose, the greatest difficulty uh, arises in the area of uh, faith versus science. When we were in France, we used to find that the biggest area of difficulty was quite often faith versus philosophy. French people are a very philosophical race. Uh, studying philosophy is compulsory even in primary schools, and you can realize they all grew up thinking they're philosophers, and so they approach everything from a philosophical standpoint. Some might say, I would like to believe, but uh, I need some evidence. And their reasoning going, goes uh, something like this. In science, evidence and proof can be obtained, so I don't really need faith for that. But when it comes to Christianity, I need to believe in something for which I do not have evidence or proof. Others might feel that uh, faith is a bit like artistic ability. You either have it or you don't have it. If you don't have it, 
there's not really much you can do about it. You can only admire it in other people. Now, the idea that uh, science does not involve faith, of course, is uh, completely false. Faith is, in fact, fundamental to science. You have to believe in the fact that what we call the laws of nature are constant and will not change during your experiment. The famous uh, Albert uh, Einstein indicated that science can only be truly explored by those who aspire towards truth and understanding, a belief that the laws that govern the existence of the universe are rational and comprehensible to reason. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without that profound faith. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Now, that is a very interesting quote, and uh, it would actually merit some examination. So I'll leave it with you. You can look up Albert Einstein's thoughts on that. Now, another uh, frequent objection to faith is this. For me, reading the Bible would be pointless because in order for it to do me any good, I would have to believe it to be true, which I don't. I've heard that a good few times. But of course, we need to assure these dear people that you don't actually need to believe that the Bible is true in order to read it. We might like to point out that we don't refuse to read newspapers because we realize that some of the stories might not be true. As Donald Trump says, fake news. We feel confident all the same to um, be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood and where we feel unable to do so, we reserve judgment until we are better informed. Now, reading the Bible is very different because reading the Bible has convinced many people of its veracity as the Holy Spirit uses the, the text to convince them of spiritual realities. So reading the Bible is a whole different ballgame. That reminds us of Paul's words in um, Romans chapter 10, where we read, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We cannot have faith in God without listening to what he has to say. So many people, you know, they criticize the Bible and they've never read it. I'm quite sure if they took the time to read it, it would give them a whole new uh, way of looking at it. But there's that kind of barrier, the Bible, I don't read it. So let us never underestimate the power of God's word. It may be a good idea to advise people to start reading in the New Testament because the Old Testament can be a bit off-putting in, in some ways. Uh, certainly you get to Leviticus and so, some of those books. But it's really a good idea to advise them to start. And I, I often advise people to start reading in John's Gospel. Uh, in John's Gospel, there are many statements made by Jesus. And these statements are backed up by his miracles. Now, speaking of the miracles performed by Jesus, it's interesting to note that they are often called signs because they all point to the truth that we already spoke about it. Jesus is the Son of God. John 20, verse 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have faith in his name. Remember we said earlier that believing that Jesus is the Son of God is the central concept of Christianity because all the rest uh, revolves around that fact. So it's good to start with the most important fact and then the rest all revolves around it. Now it would appear that it is with great conviction that uh, John records these miracles or these signs he was, of course, um, an eyewitness to these miracles, to these signs. In Greek manuscripts, we get a deeper insight concerning the reason for these signs. They were not only uh, works of very special power, they were also uh, astonishing wonders. 
but they were especially signs that pointed to something uh, more important than the physical miracle itself. Now, we take an example of that, uh, the, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. At its first level of significance, it was performed by Jesus out of compassion for the people's hunger. But that was not the only, or indeed the main purpose of this miracle. This miracle was intended to teach uh, the people that Jesus was the Son of God, come down from heaven to offer himself to them as the bread of life who could satisfy their spiritual hunger. So it's interesting to read the accounts of the miracles and um, uh, bear in mind that there is always a, a deeper spiritual reason behind each miracle. They are all signs which provide evidence. For those who are looking for evidence, they provide evidence of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, another source of um, evidence we could suggest to a seeking soul is found in the death of the Lord Jesus. Although his uh, miracles can convince us to have faith in him, the New Testament would tell us that it is rather Christ's death on the cross that supplies us with the necessary facts. The Apostle Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, for the Jews demand signs or miracles, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. That was the evidence that Paul uh, was committed to uh, announcing to others. How then does the, the cross of Christ lead us to faith? Well, it does so because it reveals to us what God is really like. If we're going to have faith in God, or if we want to encourage others to have faith in God, we will need to know what God's heart is like. Now, philosophy can't tell us anything about God's heart. It can't even tell us what's going on in the hearts of our friends and neighbors. Creation can't tell us either. It can demonstrate God's power, but it can't really tell us much about his heart. In order for us to learn uh, something of God's heart, he had to take the initiative and reveal himself to us. And uh, he did that by sending Jesus. His great heart of love is fully revealed at the cross. And we have that famous verses that all the boys and girls, I'm sure, who have just left us could quote for us. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Another piece of evidence is supplied in the resurrection. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 that the resurrection of Jesus is central to our faith. Now, we, in this church, we've been looking at that quite recently. Uh, he says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Oh, a bit of a shock to discover your faith is useless, isn't it? And how does soul destroying for a preacher to discover that his preaching is useless too? Well, that's why the resurrection, Paul says, is of such importance. Now, it is interesting to note how Paul makes such a strong link between um, the resurrection of Jesus and our faith. He does that, of course, from his own personal experience. In his unconverted days, when he was known, as we've been reminded this morning, as Saul of Tarsus, he refused to believe in Jesus and in his alleged resurrection. He also vigorously persecuted those who did believe his uh, conversion was unquestionably a very important historical event which has uh, marked our world. But what brought about this uh, dramatic uh, conversion? Well, in fact, it was the fact of the resurrection. 
Now, more evidence comes to us from the behavior of um, the early Christians recorded for us in the New Testament, but also in uh, other historical documents. And of course, um, we have read about some of them in Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. They stood firm in their faith, even to the extent of becoming martyrs in some cases. Some were imprisoned, some were tortured. You know, you wouldn't go through all of that if you were not thoroughly convinced of what you believed. To them, it was indeed very, very real. But perhaps the most important consideration when it comes to faith is the question, in whom do we need to have faith or trust? You know, when you start talking to people about Christianity or faith, their minds go very quickly to religion. I have often found that to be a great uh, point of discussion. What is the difference between faith and religion? On several occasions when I was in France, people used to ask me what my job was. At least that's when I was younger. Later on, they assumed I was just another retired UK expat enjoying French weather and culture. Now, when I told them what I was doing in France, many of them took a step backwards and uh, some perhaps afraid that I would start to preach them a sermon, uh, would say, well, that is indeed uh, fascinating, but you know, religion doesn't really interest me. And then they were a bit shocked at my reply, because I would reply back to them, well, to tell you the truth, religion doesn't really interest me either. And then, of course, they would be puzzled. I thought you said you're a pastor, and religion doesn't interest you. No, I, it doesn't really interest me at all, no. And they would take a step forward again. This might be interesting. A pastor who's not interested in religion. So they thought maybe I was on their sort of ground. Then began this very interesting, as it always was, conversation about the difference between religion and faith. That's a great way to share the gospel, which is all about personal faith, not religion. So that might be a tip for you if you're trying to share your faith with other people. Of course, some people have a kind of faith in their religion. But this, of course, is not the kind of faith that uh, links us to God. We could be absolutely convinced of the validity of something without having this true faith as described in the Bible. You know, even atheists have a kind of faith. I remember saying, I said that recently, and I, I belong to a French conversation group with U3A, and we had a discuss, discussion, which I didn't initiate, uh, on the existence or non-existence of God. I thought they would keep politics and religions out of the conversation, but no, they, someone suggested that. So we had a good discussion. Two people right away spoke up and said, I'm an atheist. And uh, of course, that gave us a start to the conversation. But when I pointed out to them that to be an atheist, you have to, have, you have to have some kind of faith to believe that God doesn't exist. Uh, a friend of mine who was a missionary in France and in Algeria for a number of years wrote this book, Il faut beaucoup de foi pour être athée. It takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. And another book available in English is entitled, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Well, my friends in the French class sat back on their laurels a little bit. They were a bit shocked by that. And uh, we had a very interesting discussion that followed about that, as you can imagine. But as we consider the word faith in its um, fullest biblical uh, sense, we see that the word implies our humble act of receiving what God has graciously given. Now, I think that's a quite a nice expression our humble act of receiving what God has graciously given. It is something which involves our entire being, uh, the heart, the mind, the will. Becoming a Christian in involves actually a, a conscious decision on our part based on evidence, some of which we have already mentioned today. We need to assure people that faith is not to be seen as a, a leap into the unknown a leap into the dark. 
Faith, faith is based on the fact of who Jesus is and what he did, how he gave his life as a ransom for all who will accept him as their Lord and Savior. So the most important element to transmit to others, in fact, is that Jesus, it's in Jesus that we need to place our faith and trust. Now, of course, someone might ask a very valid question. Well, how do I get this faith? Well, the Apostle Paul explains that in Ephesians 2, where he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We all need to remember that uh, this salvation is a gift that comes from God. It's not something that we can work up. It's not a matter of working up emotional feelings and trying to reach a spiritual high. It's simply a matter of believing God. Now, when we come to share the good news of the gospel with others, we need to remember that really it's God who gives the gift. We can't impart it to someone else. They have to believe it for themselves. They have to believe God. He justifies us on the basis of the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Now, the hymn writer put it quite well um, when he uh, said, uh, Christ on the tree bore the sentence for me, and now both, both the surety and the sinner are free. That's a very liberating verse, isn't it? Now, on a personal note, it is interesting that um, the night I became a Christian, uh, I wasn't even thinking about faith. I wasn't thinking what faith was. I wasn't thinking, how can I get this faith? I wasn't trying to work up some kind of faith or trust. I was simply reading a little leaflet that someone had given to me. And there on the second page in heavy type, it said, uh, Jesus died in your place. Now, I simply believed God when he said that. I simply believed God. You can believe in God, believe that he exists, but believing God is a bit different. I had always known that God, that Jesus had died for the sins of the world. We learn that from our Christmas carols. We learn that from uh, catechism. We learn that from all, from, from our very young. And uh, that night, I just made the mes message personal. Jesus died for me. <laughs> and uh, I just said, well, that's it. And at that moment, I said the first meaningful prayer of my life. I just said, thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me, for paying the price of my sin and my wrongdoings. There was no trying of to work up faith. As I said, I wasn't even thinking about faith <laughs> on that occasion. But uh, I realized afterwards, looking back on it, that by believing God when he said he forgave me was, in fact, an act of faith. And that gives me a different way of looking at faith. <laughs> All the muddled uh, ideas I had in my youth about faith and so on, they just seemed to fade away. And uh, so uh, it's just wonderful to know that a holy God can pardon sinful me because he punished Jesus on the cross for my sins and wrongdoings. In the words of that tremendously encouraging verses in Romans uh, 5 became a reality. We read there, therefore, since we have been justified or declared just by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Amplified Bible puts it, we have been acquitted of sin, declared blameless before God. And another version says, we have been put right with God, simply. <laughs> How very wonderful that each of us here this morning, we can have that experience. Many of us have had that experience already, I know, but it's just good to go back on it sometimes and relive that moment in our, in our lives. Of course, being pardoned and forgiven is just part of uh, the blessings we receive in Christ. Faith then opens up to us a whole new range of privileges. Paul says um, 
in 2 Corinthians 5, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And funny, we sang that in our hymn, if, if you notice there, we walk by faith and not by sight. Those of us who are older this morning may remember the Bachelor's hit song in 1966. A lot of you would think, oh, that's a long time ago. What does it say? Well, it says, walk with faith in your heart and you'll never walk alone. For with faith in your heart, the world is your own. You, will never, you, you never will grieve if in him you believe and walk with faith in your heart. Now, I know that the Liverpool fans have a slightly distorted version of that, which they sing week after week, uh, based on the principle of hope. Walk with hope in your heart. And I suppose if you're a Liverpool fan, maybe you, didn't, you do need to have a lot of hope in your heart. But of course, hope and faith are actually quite closely linked in our Bibles. So it's just great to walk with faith in your heart. Then James says to us, you can pray with faith. Before I was a Christian, I did try to pray, but I got the impression that it wasn't going past the ceiling, you know? I didn't really feel any, any contact. And um, James tells us that we can actually walk, we can actually pray with faith. And of course, three times in the Bible, we are told that the just shall live by faith. Um, also, when it comes to the time when we have to leave this world, and none of us know when that will be, we will be able to die in faith. It's great to know where you're going when you leave here. None of us know when, but it's good to be prepared. I had a friend in France who was a priest, and we used to have some great discussions and talks. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, it, it works better in French as a sort of play on words. He said, um, I'm ready, but I'm in no hurry. <laughs> and uh, I think he lived till he was 95 or something. He died there just a couple of years ago. So it's true that we need to be ready. And uh, it's good that it's said of these uh, people that we read about uh, in, the, in Hebrews 11. If we have read verse 13, it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. It wasn't just something for the moment. It was something that they had to take with them right into eternity. Now, uh, as I say, we, we don't know when our time will come, but the little verse in Habakkuk, which tells us that um, uh, faith in God also includes faith in his timing. And that's an important thing to get a hold of too, I think. To finish off with the, the words of the hymn writer come to mind, uh, where it's, he said, my faith looks up to thee, thy Lamb of Calvary, Saviour divine. Now hear me when I pray, O oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, O oh, may my love to thee pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. Nice to be able to pray that little prayer personally this morning. Let's just pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us, the gift of your Son. We thank you that uh, this gift was intended for everyone. None are excluded. And we give you thanks that many in this room have taken that step of faith and just believed God. Believed God when he said we were sinners, but believed him also when he said that we could be pardoned because he punished Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Help us, O Lord, to take it in this morning as we meditate on these things in Jesus' name. Amen.